numbers. So valuation, guys, of course, very basic. But in practice, Andy Lalo, I see a lot of questions about valuation, especially as companies uh, have complex relationships with their suppliers. We have different maquiladoras, different companies, different plants all over, all over the world. Before we get started with the show, here's a quick word from our sponsor, Global Training Center. As trade compliance professionals, you want to make sure that your procedures and documentation are completed as correctly as possible to avoid any delays and possible fines. We provide a range of trade compliance courses that will fit your needs. From in-person or web training to recorded on-demand courses, we can train one or even thousands on your team through your learning platform or on our portal. We can even customize a private session for your team. Go to globaltrainingcenter.com to find out more. Adrian, our next guest, is on the U.S.-Texas border. He is a U.S. customs broker. Go ahead. Let's let's go ahead and get started because I know you have a lot of content to cover. Yeah, thank you, Andy, Lalo. Great uh, being with you guys. And I, I'm seeing you everywhere, all the best events. So I'm, I'm, it was a pleasure to see you guys. So yeah, I wanna, I'm starting, I want to start sharing my, uh, my screen here. And by the way, if, uh, if you all are listening to this and you want to see the screens, uh, go to our YouTube channel because we have the, the screens and it's like a webinar. Hey, <laughs> a free webinar, everybody. <laughs> So basically, uh, uh, I'm going to speak a bit about importing into the U.S., which may seem or or, or it is uh, sort of like a basic uh, uh, matter, right? And many many of your viewers, Lalo, may think, well, this is so basic. I mean, I, I know this. I do this every day. Uh, so so what is what is it to it, right? Well, I mean, let's talk about it, right? Because there are many aspects that in practice can be very complicated and can be very complex. And I always like to talk about the basics because then we know and realize that the basics are not so basic, right? <laughs> Once we start discussing and looking at the details, I'm always like to give out my info just in case you guys have any questions and, and want to, you know, reach out with anything that you're seeing. Uh, we're also on social media. So this is our QR code. I mean, I guess you guys can pause it. And if you guys can want to subscribe to our newsletters, social media, we love to see you guys there as well. So uh, we start with uh, from the beginning, of course, reasonable care. Evidently, Customs asks all importer to exercise what they describe as reasonable care when providing Customs any information related to classification, valuation, duties, and admissibility. And they define it as reasonable, but I think it practice it goes beyond reasonable, right? It just means to do everything that is necessary to give Customs correct and accurate information. So I've never heard uh, someone say, say, well, it was not reasonable for me to give out the right classification or valuation. That's not, that's not going to fly, right? So we need to do what's reasonable and go beyond that. So I think that's the beginning and that's the importance of that importers need to remember that whether they, when they're dealing with customs, they need to provide correct and accurate information always, right? And these are the main focus, but there are many others that we will continue uh, discussing, of course. Uh, I think it's important to know as well what are CBP's priorities, right? What are they most looking at? Of course, agriculture and quotas, anti-dumping duties, countervailing duties. And I put their trade remedies as well, because in my opinion, we are in the era of trade remedies, Section 301, 232, 201, anti-dumping, countervailing duties. So all of that is a big deal now. This has been a big deal some, for instance, the last, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven years. Uh, it wasn't that the case before. Now it is, and we need to make sure that we are correctly declaring our country of origin or HTS goes and correctly paying any anti-dumping countervailing duties and any trade remedies if we have to. Very, very important. This is so complex in practice, but we're going to continue uh, uh, discussing it as well. That includes on the trade remedies you were talking about, <clears throat> sanctions. And uh, with uh, so many different things going on, Russia, Ukraine, we just talked about that, and uh, Lalo and I did on another show. China situation, the China-Taiwan, you've got uh, the terrorist activities with Iran, you got North Korea, and then you also have Hamas and all that going on. So with all of that, you need to vet what you're saying is have the right information and do your due diligence up front. So that's your basic things as you're getting into this, because we're going to get into more advanced uh, discussion here. Yes, exactly. And the geopolitics is now a big part of uh, trade, 
right, of trade policy. So we need to be focused and know what's out there, what's going on, who are we having as a country issues with, because that translates to policy in terms of trade. So that's a big deal right now. It wasn't before. I mean, if we think about it, we, 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 I mean, we didn't see the new stuff that directly impacted trade before, I mean, five, 10 years ago. I mean, it was like, kind of like, you know, trade, they, they said it was boring, right? Always the same, well, not anymore. I mean, I, I, I don't think it was boring then, <laughs> But it's definitely not boring now. So we need to, of course, be be mindful of all of, all of this. Uh, safety of imported products. CBP is focused on safety of imported products. And here I'm going to also start talking a bit about other government agencies. As importers, it's very important that they realize that they are responsible for the safety of the goods and that the goods comply with all U.S. laws and regulations. That's very important. And uh, we see stuff going on sometimes that is very unfortunate with, of, uh, regarding goods being imported into the U.S. that then they turn out to damage or even kill people. So it, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a huge thing that we need to also uh, be mindful as importers. And I can also say you no know, to everyone, not because a good is being sold in the U.S., it means it's safe. <laughs> I can tell you that we need to be mindful as well as consumers. What are we buying? Uh, uh, is it a name brand? Is, can we trust that establishment? Can we trust that brand? Because I can tell you, not because something is important means it's safe. Uh, I mean, that's reality, right? Because that's, that's another thing. Uh, intellectual property, of course, very important. The U.S. is one of the countries that hold the most intellectual property in the world. So, of course, we need to protect it. CBP needs to protect it, of course. Revenue, money is coming in. A big deal now, much more now than before. There are a lot of duties to be uh, uh, collected. Now, CBP wants to collect them as well, and that's important. The first agency or the foremost agency in collecting revenues in the U.S. is the IRS. The second one is CBP. And that, that sounds rather uh, 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 reasonable once, once, once we think about it. Take sales and apparel, free trade agreements and special programs. And uh, another one that I add, forced labor. This is not officially a CBP priority, but I think it now is, right, along with trade remedies. So we, and of course, as you mentioned, Andy, uh, export controls, sanctions, geopolitics, I think all of that becomes as well a priority, even if it's not official, I think we also need to keep that in mind. So very, very important. So uh, now, before importing to the U.S., what do we need to know? What do I need to talk about? Customs brokers. I mean, I think we should talk a bit about customs brokers. We are, of course, intermediaries between uh, customs and the importer, uh, and we do what is referred to as customs business, right? So that is what we do. Uh, if somebody, if anybody does customs business on behalf of someone else, they need to be a licensed customs broker, right? And in the U.S., it's not an obligation to use a customs broker, but nevertheless, more than 95%, more or less, of entries are done by an actual customs broker, right? And, and so that's interesting. I think that speaks about the value that we bring as customs brokers. And it's important also that importers understand that if they are receiving a service regarding any of this, they need to be mindful and make sure that the party that is giving them that information, that help, is actually a licensed customs broker because that's the law, right? I mean, we, we see this example regarding tariff classification. If somebody is providing a 10-digit HTS code, according to CVP rulings, they need to be a licensed customs broker. They can just be anyone, right? Uh, uh, if it's at the six-digit level, no problem. It doesn't have to be a licensed custom broker. So there is some very important details there that we need to keep in mind. Uh, and, you know, aside from, the, I guess, the obvious entry filing, well, of course, that needs to be a licensed custom broker. But there are other aspects that we need to keep in mind. I suggest all the viewers to always keep in mind what arrangements are you getting into and with a consultant, with another party, with a customer, with a supplier. Is, is that going uh, uh, for and complying with the regulations? That's best, right? Also need to keep in mind that, I think. Now, what is the role of licensed customs broker? This is my opinion, right? We need to be support and to support and advise importers, right? Uh, I've heard some brokers say, well, all I do is filing. Um, I guess that's fine. I mean, you know, if that's your agreement as an importer and that's what you need, awesome, right? But I think brokers, we need to go beyond just filing, beyond just in data input, right? We need to help importers properly declare the goods, right? We help them with classification, descriptions, ways, quantities, country of origin. 
that a merchandise is properly valued, right? That's very important, valuation. Remember, revenue, that's a focus, that's CVP priority. Also compliance with the regulations with the other U.S. government agencies. Safety of products, that's a priority for CVP. We also need to advise importers of the responsibilities. Now, we're not experts mostly on every other government agency. There are more than 50 that can regulate importations. So I, I don't know, I'm not an expert in everything, right? FDA, well, I'm not an expert in FDA, but I can tell the importer, hey, you need to comply with this law, with this regulation. Are you in compliance? Well, I don't know. If the importer says, I don't know, well, here's a consultant. Here's what you can do, right? Uh, and once you say, I'm in compliance, okay, I need this five data points, right? Which is the easy part. The hard part is being in actual compliance. That's what you need to do. It's not about the signature. It's not about clicking the right button. It's about being in compliance. Uh, declaring the five data points that CVP requires, that's usually the easy part, but it comes after being in compliance and all the hard work. I think that's also very important. Also, the correct declaration and compliance with free trade agreements. There are these programs that save us money, but we need to use them correctly, right? That is very important. It's not just about, oh, use MCA, sure, like, what, 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 what do I, where do I sign, right? Uh, it's not just about signing. It's about doing the actual work behind the qualification of your goods, right? And also, of course, proper record keeping. I always tell customers and my colleagues that, uh, regarding compliance and regarding improving with customs is not what you know, is what you can prove. You always need to have proof of all declarations that you make into customs. I think that's very important. I think that is what importers should request of their licensed customs broker with the understanding that in CVP's eyes, the importer is the ultimate part of responsible. But you need help, right? You need somebody to be there with you, to guide you. And I think a good customs broker can, can, can provide that support, right? I, th I think that's also important. Uh, we also uh, support, of course, and work with CVP. Uh, uh, you know, I always tell co uh, my colleagues that uh, customers, I mean, can come and go, right? We don't want them to go. We want only them to come. But reality is that sometimes we lose customers because of many different aspects, right? Many, many different reasons. But the part that we always work with and we always be uh, on, on our side is uh, CVP. So we also need to have a good relationship with CVP. We need to be in compliance with what CVP requests of us because ultimately the way that we can give our customers the best service is to have a good relationship with CVP. I cannot think about a broker giving their importers and customers a good service with a bad relationship with CVP. So we need to be in good relationship with CVP uh, always uh, uh, with what they request of us, record keeping, responsible supervision. Uh, if we speak about the importer's role and responsibilities, we talk about reasonable care. If we talk about customs brokers' responsibilities, then we talk about responsible supervision. So that's what defines our role and what we need to do, right? We need to make sure that our employees are doing everything they need to do, just as if we were the ones doing the work. Of course, we brokers can do every single entry, but we need to make sure that the entries are being done correctly and how they should be, right? Uh, just as if we were the ones doing them. So that I think that's the message from, from CVP, right? Uh, and there are other stuff coming in. We have now continuous training. We need to be mindful of our cybersecurity. So there are all these new aspects that we also need to be mindful regarding what CVP asks from us brokers. So I think, guys, uh, Andy Lalo, I think that's also very, very important. Um, then, of course, I, another aspect that I think is very important to keep in mind is right to make entry. So we need to always be mindful that only the importer of record has the right to make entry, right? And the importer of record is, for the most part, the owner or purchaser of the goods or a licensed custom broker. I guess that's the exception. We brokers can be the importer of record. Now, if we are the importer of record brokers, then we are responsible for everything, compliance, payment, all of that. So I think brokers seldom want to be the importer of record. I mean, but I've seen situations where a broker's... Uh, are the import of record. I guess they, they can be, right? Uh, TVP also makes it very clear that a nominal consignee uh, cannot be the import of record, but that they can designate a customs broker. Nominal consignee being usually uh, a carrier, uh, uh, you know, a trucking company, somebody that is just moving the goods, right? A full order. Uh, if they're not a broker, then they are considered a nominal consignee. They cannot be 
the importer of record, right? So I think that's important. And in essence, owner and purchaser means any of the following. It means that the party has sufficient financial interest. And that's where we see the rulings go when CVPs gets asked about right to make entry. They analyze if the party has sufficient financial interest. Of course, the INCO term, the, the terms of sale are relevant, right? At the moment of importation, who owns the merchandise? Who's the seller? Who's the buyer? That's very important. That's also very interesting. And it gets complicated when we have multiple parties to the transaction. We have a plant in Mexico that sells to a company in Hong Kong. That company in Hong Kong sells to a company in Panama. And that company in Panama sells to the final U.S. buyer. So who has the right to make entry? It can get complicated, right? Well, where's the sale taken at, right? Who owns the merchandise at the time of importation? Who's the seller? Who's the buyer? So if you have a complex arrangement in that sense, it's always uh, uh, advisable to make sure that you are fulfilling the requirements of the right to make entry regulations regarding import of record. I think that's very important. Uh, and we see those complex arrangements more and more. You know, we have this big multinationals that have a parent company here, but then the actual seller is the another company. And then they kind of do three, four sales before actually importing to the U.S. We see that a lot now. So just, you know, I think it's also something to uh, keep in mind. Um, so what else? Also, customs bonds. Uh, so the way the CVP makes sure that the importer fulfills all the all the responsibilities and that they are going to pay what they owe is via a customs bond, right? Which a custom bond, which is sure, sort of like an insurance that benefits the U.S. government. It doesn't benefit the importer; it benefits the U.S. government, right? So that's also a requirement. We see that, of course, companies that import every day they will usually have what is referred to as a continuous bond, which is a bond that is valid for a whole year. And if there's a company that imports every now and then, once a year, twice a year, well, they may go with the single entry bond, right? Uh, you know, very important aspect as well. It's very important that also importers understand their responsibilities under the bond. They have a contract. They have an agreement with customs that they will present the merchandise, that they will fulfill all the requirements, that they will present all the information, that if CVP finds that they are not in compliance, that they will return the merchandise to CVP's possession. So all of that is very important to know. And another aspect that is also very important is having the right bond amount. We see sometimes companies that are now paying more duties, and it turns out their bond is not covering the amount of duties that they owe at a certain time, and CVP doesn't like that. So my suggestion is always make sure that your bond amount is always above what you owe CVP at any given time, right? Depending if you are paying duties every week or you're paying duties every month, uh, uh, just make sure that the amount is not over your bond amount. If it's over your bond amount, CVP is not going to like that. They're going to say, hey. You know, you owe me 100000 but your bond is for 50000 I don't like this because if you don't pay, I'm going to be out of $50,000. You need to increase your bond amount. And it's best to do it proactively because if CVP tells you, then you have limited time, right? And if the surety company wants your financial, so they want collateral or they have questions, then you can run out of time and you're still getting into trouble. So always keep a mind mindset of, well, ha what did I pay last year? Do the formula, which is here, but also have keep your eyes on the future. What am I expecting to pay in the future as well? If you know you're going to increase payment of duties because of trade remedies, maybe, then you need to increase your bond amounts proactively so you don't run into trouble. I think that's also important. Uh, and also renew bonds. Sometimes we see customers saying, oh, I forgot to renew my bond. <laughs> so many, many times that's a fast. We can do it the same day. Many times if the surety company has questions, then that's a problem, right? Surety companies, not not always, they just authorize it. They may say, well, well, well let me see, who's the importer? Uh, who are they? Do they have money or not, right? Uh, so they may ask more questions. So we see that a lot as well. Well, with what you're saying is these are basic fundamental building blocks that you're looking at. And folks, it's that out of everything that Adrian's been saying, if you have questions up to this, get some experts, reach out. You can reach out to Adrian or Lalo or myself. We'll point you in the right direction. Uh, we'll either respond to you directly or, or get you to the right party. But the key here is that in doing international transactions, it's not just a willy nilly easy thing to do. There's a lot of things that, uh, that you need to have in place, processes, proce procedures, policies, your, your financial situations and all of that regarding the, the bonds and, and whatnot. So 
as Adrian said, you don't necessarily need a customs broker to make an entry. Uh, you can do it yourself, but it's like, it's like, um, it's like doing I your guess, own taxes. <laughs> I was about to say that. I was about to say that. I was going to say my kids are, are early enough in their career where things are not complicated and yeah, they can do their own taxes, but there's no way that you and I, Andy and Adrian are going to do our own taxes because we know different incomes, different revenues. Yeah, of course. I mean, if it, yeah, and some, the, the benefit that we provide as brokers is that we have many customers. And by the time that we have been in this business, 10, 15 years, we mostly have seen a little bit of everything, right? Uh, so we know how, what to do. Uh, many importers, they just have certain industry, certain type of commodity, and they may not be aware of other stuff once they start growing. So that's the value I think we provide is saying, you know what, this is what I do every day, all day. Let me do it for you. And, and we don't charge, honestly, in my opinion, we don't charge that much considering all that we can do for you for the importers exactly tvp has also been mentioning uh that hey there's a lot of vague descriptions which is again guys as i was saying this is basic but it turns out that the basic is not doesn't mean that it's covered right <laughs> so so a, a good Correct description uh, 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 is so basic, but then CBP saying now, hey, I'm seeing a lot of big descriptions. Uh, importers, don't do that. Brokers, don't do that, right? Filers, don't do that. Give me good descriptions. Always make sure that you are providing good descriptions. These are examples of descriptions that Canadian customs actually, but I think that they're equally valid for U.S. customs. These are big descriptions and appropriate descriptions. Electronic goods, electronics. That, that is not a, a a good description to keep customs. W w what electronic? What are you talking about? Oh, this is a computer. This is a monitor. This is a television. Mobile telephones, DVD players. Oh, now I get what you're importing, right? Machines. Well, well what kind of machine, right? Well, it's a sewing machine, a printing machine. Oh, okay. Now I understand. Metal. Well, what, what kind of metal? What were you talking about? There's many types of metals. So it, it, in reality, that's a description that we sometimes see uh, in other Worse than those, I guess, you know, consolidated commodities. <laughs> so what are you talking about, right? So make sure always that you have a good description. A good description is a description, in my opinion, that describes your product at the commercial level, but also that CVB can link it to an HTS code. So it's kind of like the middle. I mean, you, you can't be uh, 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 on each side entirely, right? You can use a code. Right. Well, that's a commercial uh, item that you do. A24. No, 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 no. I don't need that. Right. But also you shouldn't use the exact uh, HCS description. Uh, 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 motors. Yes. Other, other, others. <laughs> After this is that one of the uh, largest uh, use uh, descriptions that is not appropriate is parts. You know, there's always parts. And to me, I'm like, OK, auto parts, computer parts, chicken parts. It makes a difference on how you're going to clear it. I mean, is it is it animal products? Is it is it a part of a robot? Is it a part of a automobile or or what? So <laughs> you've got to put a description that, in my opinion, the general rule is it needs to be sufficient so that a you know let's say a sixth or eighth grader can look at it, read it, and know what that is. Keep it simple. And you go from there and then, you know, then you can get more detailed in, in, in the commercial invoice. But even in that, it's like, don't, don't keep it vague. You know, you've got to, and don't just use part numbers either. That doesn't do you any good. Definitely. And, uh, uh, you know, this is in addition to your correct HTS code, of course, right? It's in addition to write it. It doesn't mean we'll have a correct HTS code. Then the description can be anything. No, of course that that's, that's not, that's not right. Right. So, so yeah, definitely. Right. Um, uh, valuation. I find that in practice, uh, this is basic as well, but can get very complicated, right? In practice, and I find that in practice, many importers don't uh, know the valuation method. I mean, they 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 don't have a grasp or correct grasp on their valuation method. It's very important that as an importer, you know your valuation method and that you can support that valuation method to customs if you are asked, right? Of course, we know that the basic one is transaction value. Uh, it goes in order, right? You use transaction value. If you can't, then you go down until you can find a valuation method that you can use. Uh, but I see that many companies in the multinational industry, La Maquila Hora industry, uh, claim to use transaction value, but they don't have an actual transaction. They don't have an actual sale. Uh, because these are, you know, maquila sending raw materials for them to be with value added in Mexico and, and then sent back. And and so, no, you, you can't use transaction value if there's no transaction, if there's no actual sale. Uh, 
you need to use another method, right? And then many companies uh, use computed value, which in, in my opinion is sort of like a, the simulated transaction value. You get all your cost, everything you know, you put it together, you just you tell customs, you know what, I don't have a sale, but if I would be selling the goods, this is the value that I would give it. And it's going according to regulation, of course. So valuation, guys, of course, very basic, but in practice, Andy Lalo, I see a lot of questions about valuation, especially as companies uh, have complex relationships with their suppliers. They have different maquiladoras, different companies, different plants all over, all over the world, and it gets complicated. So always have a good grasp on your valuation method. And if you need to, use the reconciliation prototype, right? Which is where you tell customs, hey, at the time of entry, this, va this value is provisional. This is the best I have. But customs, I promise I will give you the exact amount at a later date and I will do it, right? That's what reconciliation is for. Uh, sometimes I hear customers say, well, you know, yes, my value varies, but it's just 5% of the end. So who cares, right? Well, I mean, I, I don't know any regulation that says it has to be, uh, even if, it, if it's 5%, it doesn't matter if it's not exact. Uh, I, I, don't, I haven't seen it. Maybe I mean, somebody has. Please tell me. But as far as I know, customs said you need to give me the right exact value amount for your goods, right? Because I don't accept you paying less duties than you should. Or I don't accept you giving me a wrong statistical number that I need for my own analysis and for Congress and the government, right? As far as I know. So, guys, valuation needs to be exact needs to be correct, and the proper valuation method needs to be used, right? So yeah, another thing that is basic, but in practice, very complex, guys. Very closely related is, of course, if you are a related party transaction. First of all, because that's, that's something that we declare in the entry summary, yes, related party or no related parties. And second, because that, that, that affects how CVP sees or wants to validate your valuation method. You say, well, if I'm a related party, can I use transaction value? Yes, but CVP may have questions. Does the, does the related party transaction affect the value or not? Prove to me, importer, that even if you are a related party, the transaction, the value is not affected. It's just as if it wasn't related, right? Uh, many companies can do it. Many companies can't. They say, you know what? No, I, I do give my own company uh, a partner in the U.S. preferential rates. Uh, okay, I guess you can do that. But in terms of valuation, you need to make sure that you use the right amount, right? And here is when we divide a bit the uh, uh, the fiscal aspect of it, the IRS, SAD, Mexico SAD aspect with uh, and, and separate it from customs requirements. That may not be the same requirements. Uh, you may be good with the IRS, but you may be wrong with customs. So that's something that also companies need to understand. And I see so many, sometimes, not many times, sometimes uh, fin finance department saying, I'm good because the IRS says, says, we're, says we're fine. Well, yeah, the IRS, but what about CVP, right? Remember, different focus, different focus. So always also something that needs to be uh, uh, considered. Uh, USMCA, right? USMCA, as we know, I, again, this is basic, I guess, right? You need to do your analysis. But in practice, it can be difficult to do a right USMCA analysis, right? Because BOMs, we have many different BOMs. BOMs can change. Value can change. Suppliers change. Country of origins of suppliers can change. Uh, uh, so we have all of this uh, uh, of changes that can occur at any time. Define what BOM is. Oh, bill of material. Yeah, I apologize. Yes, yes, yes. Your bill of material is the recipe uh, for your final good, right? How many items of this, that, or the other you need to create your finished good. So in my opinion, a good and correct bill of materials creates an easy USMCA uh, analysis. Yes. And and back in my day when I was doing software for for um for NAFTA, um, we used to call them costed bill of materials. One step further, right? Because um, you also need to include the non-tangible items like labor, overhead, um, assists, and all that, because that that value goes into the the product uh, determination. Correct. Definitely. And especially that's important because if you have regional value content requirements, then values and costs come into play, right? If it's only tariff shift, maybe you can ignore those because, well, it's tariff shift. So I look at direct materials, the HTS code of direct materials versus the HTS code of my finished good. But if you're talking about regional value content, then now, okay, you get into costs. And of course, costs need to be correct, right? It's not like, well, I, I kind of think that labor is this amount, so I do qualify. Uh, no, that's going to get you in trouble. 
maybe, right? If, if, if you're overstating the value added in the region, uh, and that gives you a qualification that you shouldn't have. So again, that's what also very important to keep in mind. Uh, again, I see uh, in practice many challenges because we are in a challenging environment, right? That, I, I, I mean, I don't think it's, 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 it's because people want it to be hard. It's just because we are in a complex environment where we have many different goods, many different bill of materials, many different suppliers at many different levels, and that gets complicated. So, of course, USMCA, uh, very important. Usually, you know, big companies, medium companies, big companies, they understand this. But I see many times that smaller companies, entrepreneurs, they don't understand USMCA requirements and they just sign the certification. Uh, Well, that can get you in trouble very easily, of course. Uh, And, uh, you know, just keep in mind, right? Um, I won't go over in detail this, guys, but this is actual an actual request for information from CVP, right? Where CVP says, okay, you are declaring USMCA. Now you need to provide me with this. So everyone watching this, you need to be ready to provide customs with all of these to support your USMCA claims. Again, with CVP, it's not what you know, but you can prove, right? It's not that you want... Don't tell me you qualify. Prove to me that you qualify, right? And also, CVP does not want to look at the spreadsheet that you prepared today, right? Or the format that you're preparing right now to show me. No, no, no. Send me your business documents, your processes, and the documents that you support your qualifications on a day-to-day basis, right? What you do, what do you use on every day, right? In everyday business. Uh, don't, don't prepare something for me right now, right? No, no, no. Show me what you use every day. That that proves to me that you have a good process. If you're rushing to do the analysis right now, that me, that proves to me that you're not taking care of what you need to do, right? So I think that's also important. And uh, so, yeah, it can be scary. It can be scary, especially, uh, and many companies say, yeah, I'm going to have it. Here it is. Awesome. That's, that's what you should do. If you don't feel comfortable present, presenting this information, you need to get comfortable, of course, with this, right? Uh, very important. We see more and more audits from CVP. You know, we see that relationship between China, Mexico, and the U.S. China sending goods to Mexico. Mexico gives them value added and then sends it to the U.S. So is that value added enough regarding USMCA, regarding substantial transformation? So uh, all of that, CVP knows, CVP is going to check, right? So very important in my opinion this is this is a a, a very important uh, uh uh you know challenge that we have right now and also of course us trade remedies i think we're in the era of trade remedies and we have several they can be quite challenging to determine uh some not more straightforward well you have a you have a good hts code you go to a list if your product falls there there's no exceptions you need to pay, right? And I guess that's the easiest. If if it's it's not easy, right? But again, it's basic, but not easy, right? You need to, of course, declare correctly any U.S. trade remedies and pay. That are more complex. Anti-dumping, countervailing duties assessment can get very complex, right? You need to look at the case. You need to read it because HTS codes provided in the case are for reference only. You need to go beyond that. You need to make sure that, uh, and then you need to look at your uh, components. Uh, uh, do you have any any risk of your components falling into a, tr- a trade remedy uh, action? Then if so, then you need to analyze uh, what is referred to as substantial transformation. Are you substantially transforming that component into a new good in Mexico, for example, so that now you don't need to worry about Section 301? Are you doing that or not? In practice, we see a lot of challenges with this as well because it is hard. It is challenging. Uh, substantial transformation, it is a case-to-case analysis, case-to-case basis, and, and it can get very, very complex. We have others, Section 232, Section 201, uh, there's a lot of pressure in the steel and aluminum industry right now in Mexico. Uh, so, you know, uh, very interesting this, guys. I'm not sure. Uh, we can do a, a whole seminar on each slide, maybe. Uh, but again, these are the basics that are not so basic, right? Uh, I'm, I've shared with you, uh, with your viewers, some consultation tools uh, to further research and, 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 and check their goods and make sure that is if, if you're, you need to uh, declare something you declared. Me as a customs broker, if you say that a good is country of origin Mexico and you don't tell me more, then I, I won't know that it's subject to a trade remedy. I, I need importers to tell me or ask me, right? Uh, uh, same with anti dumping country of origin. We do get warnings, right? But it's like, well, here's the warning, importer. I mean, 
do you want me to act on it or no, I'm good. Okay. I mean, again, I mean, we, we, we are brokers. We're here to help, but at the same time, we're, we're not, we're not enforcers, right? I mean, uh, I, I won't go there with the importer and grab them and say, are you sure? Are you sure you're in compliance? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I just inform you and help you, but then if you tell me you're in compliance, then I, I believe you, unless it's, it is obviously false, then of course I can, cannot, I cannot proceed. But if, uh, uh, if you tell me, if you are sure, well, then we, we proceed, right? I think also, also something to keep in mind. Ah, something uh, very also complex, uh, forced labor. Uh, again, we need to be mindful of forced labor. Uh, goods that are have a part or completely uh, manufactured with forced labor are prohibited into the commerce of the U.S. Uh, and this is a huge challenge because now companies need to have a complete tracing of their whole supply chain. Uh, and it's, it's a huge undertaking. That's why we're seeing these new tools come out uh, based on a lot of information, AI, that can track you and help you get to the source of, uh, uh, of, your, of, your, of your suppliers, to the final, right down to the atom. This is directly coming from CVP. You need to know right down from the, to the atom that you're going to make sure your good is not uh, manufactured with forced labor at, at the atom level. So that's that's also to keep in mind. This is becoming more and more of an issue where the enforcement is ramping up uh, in greater uh, efforts on uh, dealing with forced labor. So it's uh, it's one of these that again, you do your basics as we're getting into that. You're going to have to prove that your goods were manufactured with good uh, manufacturing practices and all that, and not the use of forced labor. You can't do that. If your goods are stopped at the port and you're just now checking things out, you've got to go through is what we're talking through here is some of the basic fundamentals. And this is a big factor now that is should be a fundamental where you are vetting your suppliers and your your products and the components of those products and, and where are they going through your tier one, tier two and tier three type suppliers. You're going to have to work with your manage, manufacturer all the way down. So. Yes, very, very important. And uh, yes, this, this is a big challenge for sure. Uh, and uh, what are the focus CVPs? Here are some goods that, are, that I know are CVPs focused. But again, we don't need to, we shouldn't wait for CVP to tell us. Uh, CVP wants importers to be proactive, making sure that they don't have any good in their supply chain manufactured with forced labor. Uh, again, very, very, very challenging. Here are other resources that I give viewers uh, uh, they can, you know, access CVP's web pages and uh, and and I I think also traceability tools, which even CVP uses them. So I mean, my suggestion is, well, use the tools that CVP uses, right? That 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 is how you know what CVP is seeing, right? Uh, I guess that's the way. But I, I know that in practice is challenging, and uh, I think CVP could do better as well uh, regarding communication and enforcement and being uh, open and transparent with, with, with importers. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm sure many people have pointed this out before, uh, and, and, and I'm sure it'll get better, right? It'll go better once we get a, a better grasp of the requirements and the expectations. Um, other government agencies, I, we spoke about this already. There are many, many agencies, right? More than 50 can regulate importation of goods. Very important that importers uh, make sure that they are in compliance, that they, and it's not, compliance is not giving me broker the two, three, five data points that I'm asking. No, it's making sure that you're compliance with the regulations and the law at the detailed level, right? Uh, and once you're in compliance, then giving me the information, ECC, right? Usually just, okay, yeah, yeah. This is, this is what you need to do. That's it. But again, the important uh, part, part of this is to be in compliance. Uh, statistically, the agency that regulates the most amount of goods in the U.S. is FDA. Uh, uh, and we need to make sure that we're in compliance. Again, as brokers, we tell importers, hey, you need to be in compliance with FDA with this particular law. And you're in compliance? Well, yes, right? Uh, well, what is the detail, Southern? Can you tell me each? Well, maybe I, I don't have that expertise, but I can recommend a consultant that can give you that uh, expertise. And then you can come back to me. And once you're ready, I can help you with the importation. So, you know, that's what I try to do. Uh, 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 you know, we're not experts at the detailed level, but we should be able to tell you your responsibilities, uh, at least at the CBP's perspective, at the federal level to import goods into the U.S. Uh, so also important, many people uh, 
get surprised when they find out that certain goods are regulated by FDA, uh, like a laser or uh, uh, plates or containers that go in contact with food. They, yeah, they are regulated. Cosmetics, that's a big new one. Uh, it has always been regulated, but now more so, more requirements right now for cosmetics. Uh, and some people get surprised, right? Well, I guess that's our job as brokers to inform, but then importers need to do their own job in making sure they're in compliance. Uh, uh, and again, I cannot speak about the importance of this. Uh, very, very important. We have seen very unfortunate cases of people dying or getting permanent damage because of unsafe goods in the U.S. So we need to be very mindful and careful with this for sure. Preparing the shipment. Uh, MID. Uh, basic again, but we need to make sure that you're providing the correct MID. If you're in the textile industry, uh, you will need to provide the MID of the actual manufacturer uh, of the goods, the, the the manufacturer that gives your the goods its country of origin in a few words. And we come have the global the entity identifier, new program coming in in the next few years. But my suggestion right now, get your DUS number, your LEI identifier, and your GLN number. Get it now so you have it ready. Don't wait till the last minute once we have implementation because I can tell you right now, these websites will get saturated, there will be delays, and everybody's going to be rushing. Do it now. Very important, the MID. Uh, here's more information. And of course, if anyone wants to reach out, uh, they can do so. Determination of country of origin. Very important that importers understand the difference between preferential rules of origin and non-preferential. Preferential, USM, such as the rules of the USMCA or in Spanish, the MEC. Non-preferential, used for all other purposes. And CBP uses the substantial transformation standard. So if you are at risk that your good is subject to a U.S. trade remedy, maybe because it was manufactured using a component that is subject to a U.S. trade remedy, you also need to do what is referred to as substantial transformation, which in, in, in practice, substantial transformation is more important than maybe uh, preferential uh, uh, rules of the USMCA because a preferential rule can give you a 5% savings, a 10% savings, but if substantial transformation indicates that your good is considered a Chinese good, you may pay up to 25%, right? And if you are subject to anti-dumping control in duties, Hundreds of percents, <laughs> so 400, 300 percent easily, right? Uh, of course, anti-dumping countervailing duties, I put an asterisk because that we need to look at the, uh, the case, the scope. We may need to ask the Department of Commerce. Gets a bit more complicated uh, 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 regarding anti-dumping countervailing duties. But again, this is, again, basic in essence, but in practice, very, very complex. I want to give you guys this slide as well. Uh, we have physical rules for marking, part 102 rules for marking purposes only. But if you're in the presence of possible trade remedies, such as section 301, 232, 201, importers also need to do what is referred to substantial transformation. And you can get seemingly contradictory results, such as my good is basically marked as Mexico, but in this 7501 is Chinese for the purposes of paying section 301, right? And it is uh, it qualifies for USMCA. You, you can see that, and we do see that. So again, we need to have that mindset that we have three different analysis that can give us possibly or seemingly contradictory results. Hopefully, CBP fixes this in the future. They have this this, this uh, initiative of unifying section uh, one or two rules with uh, substantial transformation requirements that, that, that can get better. But uh, country of origin marking, very important to correctly mark your goods. Basic that we see sometimes uh, not being done correctly. Uh, marking can should be done correctly as well. Crossing US customs. Remember crossing customs is just the start of everything, right? It doesn't mean you're off the hook. It doesn't mean the CVP authorized. It just means that CVP deemed it at the moment that your goods could be released. It, the, all the good stuff comes afterwards. Uh, documentation, making sure that you'll have documentation that you need. Uh, uh, and that you present it, please give, uh, give us uh, complete invoices, right? Uh, uh, with everything that, you, that, that we need, and then we can have you the entry for you in five minutes or less. But if the, in, if the invoice is not complete, then we need to ask questions. What is the escort? What is the country of origin? The description, it, it doesn't, it's too vague, right? Remember that, and then that, that delays your shipment. If you give me everything I need, then you have an entry right away. And of course, we can help you with anything you need before that and afterwards. Uh, th I think that's our role before and after importation. At the time of importation, 
get the info, do it fast. But before I can help you, afterwards as well, of course. And then we can take all the time you need, right? I mean, at the end, we, we're here to serve you. Uh, but at the time of importation, my suggestion is um, have everything that we need, right? Record keeping, this is, of course, basic, very important. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. CBP, in general, trust us, right? We submit electronic information, uh, but CBP says, Yes, but I can ask for proof anytime, usually within five years. So be ready, right? We brokers need to keep records, importers need to be records, keep records, and other parties as well. And then finally, liquidation. And uh, so it went kind of fast, but I think we made it, right, guys? <laughs> so uh, thank you, Andy Lalo. It's always a pleasure. Uh, and, uh, you know, thanks again, guys. Well, to our folks, uh, that was a very fast uh, rundown of importing in the U.S., and there's a lot there. But, Adrian, thank you so much for uh, what you uh, have done. Obviously, we've got a, a time constraint here. So, folks, we appreciate you. This is one that you can flag for educating your staff. Uh, it's one that uh, hopefully you can, uh, new hires that are into your department and whatnot. This is a good one to take a look at, come back to, and uh, and go through. The contact information is there as well. And if you have any questions, uh, definitely reach out to Lalo or myself, and uh, we'll be glad to, to point you in the right direction on, on all of that. With that, I guess we uh, need to – I know this is short, but uh, Adrian, thank, you, thank you so much. Oh, Lalo. My pleasure. Have a good one. We'll see each other soon. Yes. All right. Yes. Thank you, Adrian. Have a good one. Thank you very much for joining us. Simply Trade is brought to you by the generous contributions of Global Training Center. You can follow the show and GTC on LinkedIn or Twitter and other social networks. Make sure you check out the show notes in the description for a full rundown of today's show with all the important links. Also, make sure that you share this with a friend and subscribe on your favorite streaming platform. We really like hearing from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show or would like to sponsor Simply Trade or suggest any topic you would like for us to discuss, please contact us via email at simplytrade at globaltrainingcenter.com or you can DM us on Twitter at simplytradepod. Thank you again for the privilege of your time. Happy trading. Simply Trade is not a law firm or an advisor. The topics and discussions conducted by Simply Trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice. You should seek appropriate counsel for your own situation. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed.